morning. We pray all these things in your all-powerful name. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. It is good to be here as we continue our study of the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, I don't know about uh, you, but I have found that people in really all cultures, but in our culture, really have a hard time seeing the big picture. We would rather see kind of the news clippings, the headline, and then make all of our judgments based on that. Uh, We see it all over the place today. Harrison Bucker hates women. It's like, well, is that, you know, is that what he said? And so we, we see the headlines of something, and then from the headlines, we don't actually read the article. And then usually when we read the article, we're like, oh, actually, that's not at all what the headline was kind of leading us to at all. And and so we see this all over. We would rather a tweet or an X or whatever it's called now, we would rather have those little sound bites than actually get into the nuance of what's being discussed. And it's really easy to look at those people out there who are doing that, but sadly, I think that we run into the same problem with our Bibles. We have our favorite verses, we have our favorite ideas of what it says, and then we don't see the bigger picture or the nuances or the brilliance, really, and the beauty of the text of Scripture. We're happy with our catchphrases. And if there is one place that is we are most susceptible to that, it is the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where we see some of the most memorable statements from Jesus. Don't judge, lest you be judged. Right? And even just what we've been studying, we've been going through the Beatitudes recently, and we, we, which all of these phrases that start with the word blessed, and we've heard, I've heard these phrases, blessed are the meek, and blessed are the merciful, blessed are the poor in spirit, so many times, and they become a catchphrase. And then even this week, you are the salt of the earth, a phrase that I've heard over and over again that I'm not quite sure we know what it means. And, and And it's interesting to me that what we do with so much of Scripture is that these phrases from Jesus become interesting and fun and encouraging platitudes for us. But but these words aren't supposed to be ones that decorate the walls of our house, become wallpaper for our telephones or sticky notes on bathroom mirrors, but are supposed to be ones that are deeply embedded into our hearts. Jesus is calling us to something extreme here. He's calling us to something that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. And if we don't see the bigger picture, then we can miss the beauty of what Jesus is telling us and not understand what Jesus wants us to do. Because, you see, what we've been studying with the Beatitudes and the danger and the slow approach that I take is that we see all of these little things and we miss how what we've been talking about with the Beatitudes is actually deeply connected to what it means to be salt and light. In fact, if you want to understand the Sermon on the Mount, if you just think about it, how Maybe some of you wrote paper in schools. This might have been a long time ago for some of you, but uh, in school, I'm sorry, that was a dig. Uh, but uh, how you wrote paper in schools, you'd have your introduction, a thesis statement, and then you'd move into the body, and then you'd have your conclusion. Well, what we see that the Beatitudes we've been talking about is the introduction, but what we're seeing here is really the completion of his introduction. Like, he is summarizing what he's been saying in the Beatitudes. Being salt and light is not a separate idea from the Beatitudes, but in fact, what we see is the Beatitudes aren't catchphrases, that the kind of people who are, who are the Beatitude type people, they find their completion in being salt and light. If you are these things, then you will be salt and light. And so starting in verse 13, Jesus is going to give us two metaphors to explain what it means, who, what kind of people are poor in spirit, mourners, meek, etc. The kind of people who will be persecuted for righteousness. What, what do these people do? How do they live? Because the Beatitudes aren't abstract for us. They aren't something we do in isolation. They're something we do in this world. They will be salt and light. Now, before we, though, go too deep into that, let me remind you of some places we've been. The Gospel of Matthew is about the inauguration of Jesus the King, the promised King and the kingdom he is bringing down to earth. He is, he is the promised King of the Old Testament who will finalize God's plan for humanity and rule over the world with justice and mercy 
and righteousness. And Jesus comes onto the scene in a big way, I mean, through a lot of different ways, but specifically his baptism. And in his baptism, he is anointed as God's chosen king. He is the anointed one of God who will inaugurate this kingdom. And after his baptism, he comes on the scene crying out, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The king is here. And in this calling that this kingdom is here, he retells the story of the Old Testament by going on the mountain to tell. Just like the Israelites went to the mountain to hear the word of God. But instead, instead of Moses going up on a mountain and then coming back down with the word of God, Jesus doesn't go on the mountain as Moses. Jesus goes on the mountain as God and calls the disciples up to him. And as God, he gives them the rule, the life of what it would mean to be a disciple in his kingdom. And then he begins looking at the poor, the destitute, the weak, not the Pharisees, not the people you would expect. And he begins looking at these people, these disciples, those people that you would never expect to be called to be something in his kingdom. And he starts with the word blessed, flourishing, happy. Happy are these kind of people in my kingdom. And as we discussed last week, Jesus then ends the Beatitudes with something quite remarkable. In my kingdom, these are the kind of people that you will find in my kingdom. And then he says this, after talking about persecution, verse 12, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And Jesus says something remarkable there. He's saying, essentially, By putting them in line of the persecution of the prophets, you in my kingdom will take on the role of the prophetic task. That's what you're going to do. If you're going to be these kind of people, then you are going to be prophets. And those nobodies are described, the weak, the persecuted. What function could they have? What could these kind of people, the poor in spirit, the peacemakers, those who have no real standing in this world, what could they do? They can be in the legacy of prophets. They can be salt and light in the world. Which means they are to be God's representatives on earth. They are the vision of God's kingdom on earth. And I brought this up before, but I just think it's beautiful. Throughout church history, most people understood that the most important thing in this world, the end of man, the, what every person on this world strives for, is what is called the beatific vision, the blessed or happy vision. This means that Christians throughout all time have understood that the greatest good for any man is to be able to experience, understand, and see God. To see God. And the question of, I believe, all people in the world is this. How can I see God? How can I experience him? And then we come to a text like this, which says that church, those in the kingdom of God, here's your task. You are to be the vision of God on earth. The role of God's people from Adam in the garden to Israel and the nations to all of the prophets has been to help others see the beatific vision. To see the blessed and happy vision. Let others see God. And so this morning, we're going to see the task of these newly formed prophets in Jesus' kingdom. And we're definitely, like, don't be surprised. We're not making it to both metaphors. We're only going to be focusing on salt that these people are to carry out the prophetic task of salt in the world. In our text, now to explain then, Jesus is going to be explaining the prophetic task. What does it mean to be a prophet, to be in that legacy? And so what does it mean to be salt? And he's going to contrast two ideas, those who are the salt of the earth and those who have lost its taste. And, he's cl- and what he's doing, he's making a comparison between those who are in God's kingdom doing the task and those who claim to be God's kingdom and those who are not doing the task. So what we have here is, what does it look like to be a true prophet versus what does it look like to be a false prophet? And so that's what we're going to spend the rest of our time going through this metaphor to describe what a true prophet is and then what a false prophet looks like that we would know how to live as people who are blessed in the kingdom of heaven. So let me pray for us one more time before we do that. Father, <clears throat> as we seek to understand your word this morning, Lord, we want to understand what your word has to say rightly. Father, we want to be a people who are obsessed with the word of God. We want to be a people who who care deeply to know what this means, that we believe that there is true power and meaning in these words. 
and that they affect us, and that through the proclamation of your word as it is done rightly, that your spirit and your presence is with us. So, Father, keep me from error. Keep the church from hearing error. Help us to uh, just love and know your word better. Give us attentive ears and uh, the ability to listen and then to live out what we hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, so first, first, let us understand what a true prophet looked like. So if you look at our text, Matthew 5, 13, it says this. He, a true prophet is described with this metaphor. You are the salt of the earth. Now, this text has uh, so much written about it because there are so many different interpretations of the metaphor. However, I think that as we'll study it this morning, it's not actually that complicated. Now, we know that salt is one of the most essential elements in world history. In fact, it is probably one of the most precious commodities in the world. For instance, the Greeks believed that salt was one of, God's, one of their God's favorite offerings, that they would offer salt with all of their things. And in fact, it was deified about the same as the sun was. So we think about them worshiping the sun god. Well, the salt god was a, was a big deal as well. Salt was used to preserve food without refrigeration, clean wounds, create medicines, add flavor, purify water, etc. And you've probably heard the expression before, he isn't worth his salt. Well, that originated in ancient Greece because people would use salt as a currency in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, so a soldier would be paid in salt. Slaves were bought and sold with salt. So if someone didn't live up to their, expecta their expectation of what they paid, they're not worth their salt. Now, in Hebrew thought, salt is equally important. Specifically, it has those kind of connotations, but we see in the Old Testament that salt takes on a particularly important symbolic meaning. Now, when Jesus is speaking of salt here, I think he is referring to a specific phrase that comes up in the Old Testament. And there's going to be two places I'm going to turn you to, have you turn to to get what Jesus means. The first one, if you will, Leviticus chapter 2, Leviticus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. So Leviticus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Right in the beginning of the Bible, if you don't know where that is at, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 2. And while you're due there, so the book of Leviticus is a book where God is giving his law to uh, the priests, the Levites, the tribe of Levi. So what is the law the, for the Levites? Those who are to take the offerings to God and do all the sacrifices to God, like how should they conduct themselves as God's priests? So Leviticus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. It says this, No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you may bring them to the Lord, but they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing aroma. You shall season all of your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offerings. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Okay, so there's a really important phrase there, and it's the phrase, the salt of the covenant. The salt of the covenant. And if you are unaware, a covenant is a promise between two priorities. God is, describes almost, he describes all of his relationships with others in terms of covenant. So a promise to be their God and they will be his people. It's a, it's a covenant. It's a relationship. It's a, it's a camaraderie. It's a joining together. And so God is joining himself to the people of Israel. And so when he, we're talking about the priests and the Levites, we're talking about the sacrifices that are offered in order to maintain this covenant with God. And when God describes his love for people, it's always in the, in the phraseology the, of a covenant. So, when God takes this vital element, and it represents purity, preservation, and endurance, and what he does, salt, is he includes it in his expectation of an offering. Because it is going to be, the salt now, is going to be a symbol of their covenant relationship with God. So to the Hebrew, salt is going to be offered with all of their offerings as a symbol of God's enduring preservation covenant with his people. That God is going to be their people, and he's, he's going to keep loving them. The covenant of salt is another way, then, of explaining, symbolizing God's covenant with his, his promise to be joined and united with them. So that's, that's the symbolic name. Now, one more place. If you go to Numbers chapter 18, so this is the next book in your Bible. 
Leviticus, Numbers, chapter 18. And we're just going to look at verse 19 here. So Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 19. It does, God is again describing how the Levites can use their offering to feed themselves. And in discussing this agreement, so Leviticus chapter 18, verse 19, it says this, All the holy contributions that the people of Israel present to the Lord I give to you, and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord for you and your offspring and for your offspring with you. So what we see here, it's perpetual due. It shall never stop being done. And the way it's described in this covenant, this promise to the people of Levi, is a covenant of salt. So salt is symbolized as connecting to an enduring, lasting covenant between God and his people. Now, back to our text then, and what we're thinking there. When Jesus then is saying, you are the salt of the earth. He is referring to the salt offering that's offered, the covenant of salt. So here is what then he means. When he says, you are the salt of the earth, he is saying, you are the symbol of God's covenant on the earth. That's what he's saying. You are the symbol, the representative of God's everlasting covenant on this earth. You are the salt of the earth. I don't know if you're hearing me right, because this is incredible. You, not salt, not this offering that's put before the Lord, not something the Levites and the the sacrifices do, you are the representative on earth of God's covenant to humanity. You. You are the salt of the earth. You represent that God's lasting love and dominion over his people will not end. You represent that God loves with an enduring forever kind of love. You are the representative that God doesn't give up on his promises. You. He, you represent that God is making a way for sinners to come into his kingdom. The covenant of salt is offered that when God is given these offerings, the salt is with it as a representative that the offering is acceptable and pleasing to God and that he will not go back on his promises. And now he is going to offer Jesus on the cross and then with that offering, he is going to give a covenant of salt to the nations, to the world, that this offering is acceptable and enduring and will never end. And that is you, church. You are the covenant of salt. That is what a prophet does. That's what a true prophet is. They represent, they herald, they demonstrate, they show, they point to. They are symbols to represent that God has sent a covenant to earth. This is why we have been left as prophets. And we know that's what Jesus means because of the next metaphor he's going to give. Light. Light and salt are connected here. What is the role of light? Point people to the covenant. And what does salt do? It points people to the covenant. And this is the role Israel was supposed to take when they became the people of God, his kingdom. They were to be a blessing to all the other nations. They were to be the salt of the earth. They were God's covenant to the other nations. And now Jesus calls disciples up on the mountain as God himself, as he lays it out and says, you are my salt in this world, giving them the charge. You are the prophet. You are the bridge between the covenant, God's covenant. You show people, you give people the beatific vision. You show them me. That is what a true prophet does. So if that's what a true prophet does, then we have to look at the rest of the text to see the false prophets. What a false prophet looks like to contrast those who are not really salty. And I think that will help us further explain what it means to be salt. So if you look with me at verse 13, again, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Now, a lot here can be confusing. This passage has, again, interpretations, but and part of the confusion is, is that pure salt doesn't lose its taste. Like, It's impossible. It's like a debate whether water is wet. Sorry to open that can of worms. If water has lost its wetness, how can it be wet again? Like, that's what Jesus is saying. If water has lost its wetness, how can it be wet again? The question is ridiculous. How can a thing 
be a thing and not be the thing it is simultaneously, right? Like, it's just not possible. An early Jewish source called the Talmud has a humorous passage in which a student asks a rabbi how to make salt salty again. In pretty graphic language, so if you're sensitive here, earmuffs. In pretty graphic language, the rabbi says this, one should salt it with the afterbirth of a mule. And as many of you know, mules are sterile. They can't become pregnant in the first place. And so as one commentary said, the rabbi is saying, those who ask stupid questions deserve stupid answers. Real salt can't lose its saltiness. It's impossible. And so if this is true, like salt can't lose its saltiness, what does Jesus say if salt loses its taste? Like, what does that mean? So understanding a little bit of the historical setting will help us here. In the first century, salt isn't usually pure salt. It has to be diluted from other sources to be found. So they'd pull it out of the water from the Dead Sea or harvest it from the ground. And the process isn't always very good. So you'd have salt, but this salt would be mixed with all of these other chemicals and impurities from the Dead Sea or the ground. And over time, you would have these little pieces that would look like salt, but be different chemicals. And these other chemicals were false salt. And over time, they would ruin the true salt. The purity of the salt would be lost, and the ability to use the salt for any purposes would be destroyed. And this idea is important because if you look back at the text, it says this. The word, it says, it lost its taste. Scholars have debated how to translate this word, and it's not, it's one of those words, I'm not sure we translated it very well here. Okay, so it is, because it's not the typical word for taste, and I understand that what people are trying to get at, but you'll see in multiple translations different things. In, in the Greek, this is all one word. The word lost its taste is all one word, and it's frequently the word used for foolish or stupid. It's actually the word moronic. It's the word where we get moron from. So the idea is this. If the salt becomes a moron, how can it become salty again? If it becomes moronic. This is a word that is frequently used in Scripture when impurities come in and dilute truth. When impurities come in, it becomes moronic. The idea is here that Jesus is getting at is that the salt, if salt is diluted with all of these impurities, what purpose does it have anymore? The salt is ruined. This word is used in other places when impurities and idolatry seep into people's lives. For instance, this is why we read this, Romans chapter 1 earlier. Listen to this. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became moronic in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became morons, fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. People know God. They knew God, and they let these impurities creep in. They mix their knowledge of God with the knowledge and worship of created things. They became moronic. And that's what Jesus means here. True salt can't lose its saltiness. That's not possible. But impure, not true salt, can be ruined. It becomes moronic because it's not natural salt. Impurities creep in. The saltiness is lost. And here's his idea. If you are claiming to be one of God's people, you are the salt of the earth. But if you are claiming to be salt and you are moronic, you are mixed with all kinds of impurity, what purpose do you have? What, what good are you? Because you're not pointing people to his covenant that Jesus saves sinners. And this is, connects what Jesus has been saying about righteousness which we studied a lot, and where he's going to go next. You need to have true righteousness. And here's the thing. <clears throat> I think Jesus very clearly, very clearly, is the, the, the enemy he's attacking here is the Pharisees and the false story of Israel. And I actually think in this one verse here, you have a retelling of the whole story of Israel in one verse. Because that's his primary audience, the Jews. And you have this nation of Jews that is claiming to be the blessing of God. We are the people of God. We are the covenant of God on earth. And then what is the story of Israel again and again? Impurities coming in, right? They're supposed to go into the land of Canaan. And they're supposed to get rid of all of these nations that are going to cause them to fall away. And what do they do? They let them stay. They let impurities stay. And then over time, their saltiness is diluted. It becomes moronic. It's impure with all of these false things. 
And then what happens? They can't be the covenant of God and the nations. And then what happens with the kings of Israel? They, God tells them, do not go and find a bunch of foreign wives. Don't go marry foreign wives because they're going to dilute you. And then what happens? They do it anyway. Over and over again, the people are diluted. And so then we have this setting where Jesus is coming in, and we've already seen John the Baptist just come down real hard on the Pharisees. And we see that the Pharisees are his primary enemy because your righteousness needs to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. And remember, that doesn't mean he's, not, he's telling us, no, we don't need to be righteous with how we live. No, he's telling us they don't have righteousness in the first place. They're not truly righteous at all. Theirs is a false righteousness. And you have this people that are claiming to be God's covenant on the world, and they are full of impurities. They are filled with anger, hatred of their brother, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliations. They don't love their enemies. When they give, they give to be seen. When they pray, they pray to be seen. When they fast, they fast to be seen. They lay up treasures for themselves on earth, and they are anxious about everything, not trusting God to provide for them. They judge others, and they don't come to him. They do not follow him. And then what is the primary sign of these people? If you look at chapter 7, verse 15, Listen to what he says. Beware of the false prophets. Who are the false prophets? Beware of the false prophets. Those who have lost their saltiness. Who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Here is the thing. A false prophet claims, claims religion, claims to be one of God's people, but has no righteousness, are filled with impurities. They look like salt on the outside, but they are not salt. And so what purpose do they have? How can they be useful representatives of the covenant? They can't. They are only suitable to be trampled on by others. And again, I told you, I I think that Jesus is really just giving us the story of the Old Testament in this one verse. Because that idea, that that phrase, trampled on by other people, is a phrase used of Israel when other nations come in to dominate them. And today, man, we see that with people. They claim to follow Jesus, but they don't actually want to follow him. They live in open sin and rebellion and refuse to give their lives over to him. And the idea is this. You can't say that you're the salt of the world and then still love your impurities. No, that's not true. In fact, instead, the opposite is true. Judgment is coming. Jesus is telling us here that if we want to be the kind of people that are marked by the Beatitudes, who are his prophets in the world, Watch that your life is not marked by impurities. A prophet is known by their fruit. And so to summarize, Jesus is teaching us our role in the world, and he does it by contrasting a true prophet with a false prophet. A true prophet is God's covenant in the world. A false prophet pretends to be salt, but is filled with impurities. And so as we think about this, my desire for Bethel Baptist is that we would be a people of salt. I want us to be a people of salt. So with that in mind, let me give you a few principles that I think are going to help guide us in being salt. First and foremost, be sure you are a part of the proper kingdom. I've said this nearly every week, and I'm going to repeat it again and again. The Sermon on the Mount does not start in Matthew chapter 5. It starts in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then it is his disciples. Then he calls repent. He goes and calls his disciples. Then he goes on the mountain and it is his disciples that come forward to him. We have to repent first. I don't care how many good deeds you've done. Your primary problem is a wicked heart. And only Jesus can change us. If we have not repented first, there is no way we can be cleaned on the inside. We can be made pure on the inside in order to follow him. That's just not... 
that's not possible. The reason that the Pharisees are called false, false prophets is first and foremost because when they are confronted by Jesus and John the Baptist to repent, they won't do it. We are impure first and foremost because we don't repent. We refuse to repent of our sin, and this isn't a one-time thing. This is a regular, ongoing repentance that we do. So we have to repent. First and foremost, if you want to be salt of the earth, you have to repent. But secondly, secondly, we have to stay on mission. There are so many things Christians think that they're supposed to do in this world. Many Christians, I think, even misuse this very verse to go off mission. So let me just give you some of the interpretations here. Some Christians believe that this verse is teaching us that we are to be the moral preservative of God in this culture. If salt is used to preserve things, we keep the world from getting as bad as possible. That's not going so well. Some Christians believe that this verse is teaching us that we help purify and clean the world. As we enter, we improve it, and we improve people over time. Some Christians believe that this verse is teaching us that we add flavor to the world. We're the spice of the world, and we just make it a nice place, an exciting place to live. Some Christians believe that these verses teaches us that we are to be the, this is real, we are to be the salt in people's wounds. <laughs> you know, like we make the world uncomfortable. But remember about all of the obnoxious talk I talked about last week. That can't be what Jesus means. Like we're not supposed to be obnoxious in this world. So none of those things are what Jesus means. And while they sound good, they are not our primary missions. The, pro- the prophet's mission, the prophet's mission is not to simply keep people as being as morally bad as they could be, make them more moral, make the world more enjoyable, or say things just to hurt people's feelings. The prophet's primary task is to point people to the kingdom of God. He is to say, he is sh- or she is to say what has been told to say to them. He is to point to one person and one person only, and that is Jesus Christ. That is the job of a prophet, and that is the only job of the church. Many excellence in this, excellent things in this world could take the church's time. There are great humanitarian programs we could do. There are great political issues we can be involved in. And I hope Christians do great things in the world. Do not let good things get in front of the primary thing. The prophetic witness that holds out the terms of peace. Third, third, while we repent, while we stay focused, we have to be diligent to cast out impurities. We have to check our salvation with fear and trembling. We are to strive to enter the rest of God. And I mean this both individually and corporately. Listen, individually, if impurities are in your life, I know some people want to take the Sermon on the Mount and and we want to read it and we want to feel better about ourselves and we want to say Jesus isn't really calling us to anything but repent. No. Like, start living differently. Repent, and when you fail, go repent again, and then start living differently. Get rid of impurities in your life. Like, start doing the things that Jesus tells us to do. Salt can't be moronic. It doesn't make any sense. It can't be filled with impurities. You have to strive to get rid of these things. It's a contradiction to say, I follow Jesus while I love and will not let go of my sin. That doesn't make any sense. And we live in a world that is okay with oxymorons. I mean, I hear phrases all the time like, well, I identify as a homosexual Christian. That makes no sense. You can't be the covenant of God and then be okay with impurities against the covenant of God. And I'm pretty sure most of us in here would say, like, yeah, those guys are bad. Like, don't do that. And then it's like, what kind of sins would we identify ourselves with? I'm a greedy Christian, angry Christian, argumentative Christian, prideful Christian, adulterous Christians. And golly, if I hear one more time someone who's a jerk who says, that's just my personality. Well, would you get a new personality? <laughs> Seriously, stop, stop using the born this way argument. With regards to your sexuality or your attitude, it will not stand up on Judgment Day. In Colossians, we are to put off the old self and put on the new self, created in the image and likeness of our Creator. Get rid of impurity. Get rid of it. Don't play games with it. We have to get rid of it. But that means that we can't play games with impurity corporately either. The scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament are clear that impurities have to be removed. 
If someone is in sin and they are refusing to repent, to change their ways, they are to be removed. It isn't because God doesn't love people, but because he loves them so much that he wants them to come to his covenant. Lastly, let me say this. Lastly, let me say this. And I think this might be the most important thing I'm going to say, so please hear this. Represent this covenant with grace and mercy. I haven't really gone into this, but I I think that this is the most important thing. When Jesus is telling us to be the covenant, we have to ask this. What kind of covenant are we to represent? We are to represent a covenant marked by God's love for the weak and helpless. The kind of covenant that will die for people who are his enemies. The kind of covenant where God will say to Peter, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? No, 70 times, seven times. We are to live by, and and here's the thing, if, if the covenant of our life, if the mark of our life is not mercy and grace towards others, then how could we, if that's the covenant and we're not doing that, then how are we representing it? And I think this has two, again, two applications, both individually and corporately. Individually, let me say this. Stop wallowing in self-pity. Stop it. Repent of your sins and move on. If you want to represent the covenant of mercy to others, then take on the covenant of mercy for yourself. You can't continue to just go back and live in what you've done. Here's the beauty of the Sermon on the Mount. You will never obey it perfectly. But all you repent, and God forgives you, and then you try again. And when he forgives you, it's done. You can't continue to live in in how evil you are. Trust in the finished work of Christ. Apply the covenant of mercy to yourself. And I find it interesting that throughout Scripture, I was just looking through it, you never see any of the prophets or the apostles go back and continually wallow in their self-pity. If they're talking about their past, it's to glorify how good God has been in their forgiveness. Not to say, oh man, I just stink so much. Like, you just don't see that. It's like, man, I'm not great, but God's mercy is really, really good. And that's where they go every single time. Uh, Recently, my kids and I have been reading through the Chronicles of Narnia. And uh, if you don't know, uh, Aslan the Lion, he's a Jesus figure. And if you haven't read it yet, I'm not really sure what to tell you because, like, it's been out for a long time. So, so put your earmuffs on if you don't know how the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe end. Okay? So put them on right now. Well, these four children make their way into a land called Narnia where one of the boys, Edmund, is a rascal. I mean, he's just a rascal. He's the worst. He is evil in so many ways. He becomes a traitor to his family. He goes and serves the evil white witch, and Edmund tries to get away from the witch, but he's a traitor. Because he's a traitor, he's bound to her, and in the land of Narnia, man, I'm a nerd right now, but in the land of Narnia, he is bound to her by these deep magical forces, and only blood will atone for his traitor. So Aslan steps in, and he's, he's going to step in to die for him, and he can free him. And, uh, and, the, and there's going to be blood spilt because uh, Edmund must have blood spilt. So while Edmund is a captive, Aslan comes and takes him and uh, rescues him, and, and he takes him out into a forest and, and talks to him all by himself. And, and as the conversation ends, man, I love this. Um, man, I'm, stop. I'm not a girl. Okay, here we go. Aslan brings Edmund. Not that there's anything wrong with girls crying, so I'm sorry for saying that. Okay. Aslan brings Edmund to the rest of the family. And I think this is the best line in the line of the witch wardrobe. Listen to this. So he's telling him that he's about to die for him. Nobody knows what's happened in the conversation. And Aslan presents Edmund, this traitor, to the rest of the people. And he says, here is your brother. And there is no need to talk to him about what is past. He's a traitor. What do you mean? People have died because of him. But when Aslan rescues him and restores him, it's done. It's done. And there's no need to talk about what is past because he is new. He is redeemed. He is free. And even when the witch comes to accuse him, even when, because she doesn't know Aslan's plan yet, and she comes, and she comes to Aslan, and she's accusing him, he deserves to die. Edmund is so transformed by what has happened, it says that he can't even take his face off Aslan. He doesn't even, he doesn't even hear what the witch is saying. 
because of what Aslan is about to do to him. I think many of us in this room probably need to hear these words this morning. There is no need to talk about the past. Mercy has been given. Stop being so proud that you think the finished work of Christ isn't enough. It is finished. Be done and move on. But I think, I think that there's probably a lot of us in here that need to take that same lesson and start applying it to how we're treating others. How can we be the covenant of mercy for other people when we won't even show mercy to other brothers and sisters in Christ? We are stuck not in just our past sins, but the past sins of others. And I'm not, I don't know how else to say it, but drop it. There is no need to talk about the past. If God has shown them mercy, why can't you show mercy? It's an impossibility. And so while we are very concerned with impurities in the church, I'm afraid that the church, we ebb and flow on this paradigm, I'm afraid so often that the church is living right now with what's happening in our culture today. We are in such a state of fear in such a state of protection that we have to go out of our way to make sure every minute impurity is out of the church, and we have forgotten that God came to show us mercy. He came to show us mercy, and so yes, I'm not trying to discount the impurities, but show one another grace and mercy when we fail. And if we can't do that to even those who call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ— How can we possibly represent the covenant of salt, God's eternal love to us? I said this in the sermon we talked about mercy, but I I think it's worth repeating. Whenever we talk about God's mercy to us, it is unending, it is unbound, it is forever, it is beautiful. And we never go out of our way to qualify the mercy of God. I mean, it is when we talk about it, it is beautiful. And yet, when we talk about our mercy, the first thing we do is, yeah, but maybe not in these circumstances. But you don't know what they did to me. No, we want to be the covenant of God, be salt, show the mercy of God. And so repent of your sins, stay on mission, rid yourself of impurity, and live in mercy. And may we be a people that heed the call of Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall it be salt and this be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. Your word is so good. It is so powerful and mighty, Lord. Forgive us where we fail and help us to live in repentance and grace and mercy again and again, but a repentance that changes us. Lord, we love you and pray all these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. Would those doing the Lord's Supper please come forward? Each week we do the Lord's Supper.